so glad you guys are here today. Would you take a moment to turn to the people around you and say, he won't fail. For those of you online, we're so glad that you're here this morning. Again, if I haven't met you, my name's Lane. I'm the student ministry director, and I am joined by one of my good friends, Bethany. She Hi, is, good morning. She is our kids director with us here at Vineyard Cincinnati. And Bethany, I do have to say, you are wearing some incredible shoes this morning. I know. Well, I'm so excited for our pajama and pancake party. That's um, today, right? Bethany, that's... That's next weekend. Oh, oh, I was just... Next weekend. I'm sorry. I was just excited. so excited. Um, so kids, next weekend, we are having a pajamas and pancake party with you, your friends, and hundreds of pancakes. Hundreds. Hundreds. It's wow. going to be super duper fun. So this is a great weekend to bring a friend with you to church, to hear some of the good news that you get to hear every week, and to eat a thousand pancakes. We're just going to keep mo moving it up. A million pancakes next time, right? Yes. Next service. All right. Well, we also have our students who are in the house with us this morning because it is a Worship Together weekend. And yeah, you can shout out our students. We love our student ministry. And uh, let me tell you about a few things that we have been up to recently. Uh, one thing that we love, especially in our middle school ministry, is once a month we get to participate in Friday night fun nights. And this past Friday night, we got to have an experience, well, I guess it was two Friday nights ago, we got to have our annual Bigfoot hunt, and we had over 50 middle schoolers come out and run around the, the campus searching and discovering where Bigfoot was. And so if you're in middle school, we would love for you to come check one of those out on a Friday. These are just opportunities to hang out with our church family and have a lot of fun in a safe community. And one other thing we're really looking forward to is our fall retreat, which is coming up this upcoming weekend. We have to partner with some other vineyard churches in the Cincinnati area, and we are taking a group of around 100 people to this weekend, which is so exciting. We, we cannot wait uh, to see all that God has in store for that. Uh, so if you're not familiar with retreats, they're an opportunity where we have to just get away from all the distraction and the hubbub of everyday life, and we get to uh, encounter God in a, in a special and unique way. Retreats are probably about my favorite thing that we get to do as a student ministry because we get to experience sp spiritual breakthrough. We get to have lots of fun uh, together. We get to uh, do a lot of um, games and stuff, stuff like that, and also get to take that next step of faith together. So uh, my, my big question for you guys as a church family is, like, would you pray for us as we step into this next weekend, uh, as you think about us? Because we, we want to see students come to know Jesus for the first time as we uh, celebrate together this next weekend, and also for other students who already know Jesus to, to maybe re repent and return back to Jesus for uh, different things that they're going through. But if you're interested in getting involved with Vineyard Kids or Vineyard Students, we would love to talk to you. We are passionate about this next generation because they're not just the future of the church, but they are the church today. And they need people like you to disciple them. And if you're interested in getting involved with what we're doing in Vineyard Kids or Vineyard Students, find somebody in a Vineyard Kids shirt, like what Bethany is wearing, or a Vineyard Student shirt, and we'll be out at the Welcome Center, and we would love to talk to you more about what that looks like. And Lane and I get the privilege of getting to see just incredible things happen back in student ministry and kids ministry. So we don't want you to miss out on that. And one of the things that we get to see is generosity. Um, kids and students are leading the way in being generous as modeled by their parents, as modeled by their leaders. And um, they're learning how to be generous with their money and their talents and their time. And I don't know if you know parents, but those Vineyard Kids volunteers that you see every week at your kid's classroom are not just giving their time on Sundays. They are committed to praying for your kids. Um, so a few weeks ago, the Vineyard Kids volunteers got together for a vision night where they said that they were gonna pray for your kids by name every day this year. So kids, your volunteers are praying for you. Parents, you have another partner in raising your kids up in the faith, in um, caring for them, and in showing them more of who Jesus is. 
and Lane. I know that Vineyard students are also learning about generosity because of what my student came home talking about. That's right. Yeah, because we, we want this to be a, a, a church-wide initiative. And in student ministry, we talk about how God gave his first and his best best through the person of Jesus. And so in response to what God has already done for us, we give our first and our best back to God. And that includes our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so whether that's five bucks that you're making from babysitting, whether that's $10, whether that's $100, like God, like he, he cares about our money because he cares about our heart. He cares where our, our heart posture is toward him. And so that's why we practice this all the way from, from kids through students and all the way up through um, adulthood. And that's great. Thanks so much for partnering with me and teaching my kid about tithing, Absolutely. even though I've been doing it. Um, so at the Vineyard, we practice the tithe, which if you haven't heard it before, um, it's a biblical principle closely tied to one of our values around generosity. And our value is this. God is generous to us, so we live generously with others. We serve with our time and talents and give financially by tithing or taking next steps towards giving a percentage of our income. That's right. And when we bring back our tithes and our offerings to God, we honor him and we also bless other people. So thank you to those of you who have already taken this step of faith in tithing. And to those of you who maybe haven't stepped into this yet, but maybe you feel like God is challenging you in, in a way like that this morning. And we would love for you to step into our 90-day tithing challenge. You can scan the QR code that's up on our screens and you, you could simply go to vineyardcincinnati.com slash challenge where you can sign up for that initiative today. So there are three ways that we give of our regular tithes and our offerings. And uh, the first way is that you could go and make your gift online. That's what my wife and I do. Uh, you can text or you can drop your gift off of any of the gift boxes on your way out this morning. So as we kind of step into this next part of our service, would you just pray with me as we pray over our tithes and our offerings, but then also for our students as they head to fall retreat? Awesome. Well, uh, Lord, we, we bless you and we, we, we honor you above all else. You are good, you are kind, you are patient with us, and you are faithful through it all, even when we are not. So we, we thank you for just the opportunity to even partner with you in small ways, like through the tithe. So God, would you um, just help this just to be a blessing to other people as you have blessed us so richly. We also pray for our students this next weekend, that they would encounter you for all that you are, to get away from all of the, the distraction and the, the things of this world that so easily tie us down, but to fix our eyes on you as the author and perfecter of our faith. So God, would you do a work in our students this weekend that they would come back not only recharged, but um, with, with an initiative to take your gospel forward to a world who needs you. So God, we love you and we, we thank you in advance because you are a God who does not fail. We love you. We worship you this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm pumped to be with you this morning on Baptism Sunday. You guys ready for this? It's going to be good. I'm so excited. Worship Together weekends are a blast. Kids, so good to have you in the room as well. And if you haven't been with us in this series, we are in a series called Jesus Said What? Because Jesus said shocking, weird things, like repeatedly, and specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, he kind of flips everything. We talk about the upside-down kingdom of God. And Jesus teaches us a new way to live because we all have a tendency to put ourselves at the center as if life is all about us. And he's like, actually, it's not about that. I want to teach you another way to live. I want you to live as if God's at the center and that he's what life is all about. And I'm going to teach you a different way that has a greater perspective. So we've been looking at so much throughout this journey and we've seen some things like, hey, when we have secret prayer or prayer in the private place, we actually connect with God more than we impress others. Or we looked even last week about this idea of fasting, 
about how sometimes we give up something to gain something better, that we have a deeper connection with God as we go without and feel some of the loss or the, the gap, dependency that's in us, and we realize, oh yeah, we're incredibly dependent people. And so I don't know if you fasted Friday, but I felt it as well, and I look forward to next Friday as I'm going to continue to say, Jesus, I want more of you, more than I want food. So we naturally see the world in a certain way, but Jesus ushers us into the upside down kingdom. So there's three main points we've been talking about every week. Number one, Jesus alone makes us right or righteous. In in other words, you cannot save yourself. If you're trying to do it by good deeds, you cannot achieve righteousness. Jesus alone makes us right with God and right as he made us to be. And seek Jesus first to experience being made right. As we seek him, we experience more of the righteousness that he's already purchased for us. And then last of all, choose to practice living right or righteous in light of being made right. You see, it is in the identity that we already have received that we then live out of that and experience all that God has already purchased for us. And then Matthew 6 moves even more to this idea of right living comes from the right heart, and our motives matter. And that's what we're going to unpack today as we continue to walk through Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. We're going to talk about this this issue of the heart about treasure. So the question for you this morning is, what do you treasure? What, like, really matters to you? Whenever I was in middle school, what really mattered to me was my starter jacket. I don't know if anybody ever got a starter jacket back in the day, but it was like a big deal at one point. And one Christmas, I had been begging for it, and finally I got my starter jacket, and I was the man when I went to school. I mean, I knew all the fellas were jealous and all the ladies were looking, right, because I'm wearing my starter jacket. Now, it might have been over my silk shirt, and I might have had some weird orthodontic device and some big old glasses at that point, but in my mind, I was the man, all right? And I wore that starter jacket every day, and I was just, it was everything, right? Until one day, I left it in the locker room uh, during gym, and I came back to get it, because I was like, oh, shoot, I I left my jacket. I went back to get it, and it was gone. Somebody had taken my starter jacket, and I was brokenhearted. I was asking everybody. I was searching everywhere, like, where's my starter jacket? And no jacket. And my chance to be the coolest guy in school was now over. And I was, I went home, of course. My parents gave me the normal, you lose everything speech. And and I was like, dang it, here we, again. And this is where we enter into this whole idea that Jesus says, do not... Store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, long story short, I actually found out it was stolen. Somebody had taken it, and they actually wore it back to school, which was a whole other thing. I ended up getting the jacket back, which was crazy. But when I got the jacket back, it was so weird. It was as if... It was no longer the treasure. My eyes had already moved on to something else. Have you ever had that happen? This thing that you really wanted that you thought was everything, you get it, and it's not quite what you thought it was going to be? So the first thing we have to recognize is that our treasures change. Actually, C.S. Lewis said it this way. I think this is pretty brilliant. He says, there was something we grasped in that first moment of longing which just fades away in the reality. It's almost like we find more joy in the treasuring of something than actually having that thing. Because once we grab it, it's kind of like grabbing smoke. It looked like something, but nothing was actually there. Because we treasure things that don't last. The other way that we can interpret the verse that we're looking at, Jesus, I mean, in the Greek it says, do not store up stored up things. Because we're all about storing up so we have this experience of security and independence. That's really our goal in life. We want to feel like I have a fortress, nothing can touch me, I'm secure, and I'm going to be okay. And it's not necessarily wrong, but Jesus challenges that don't 
don't focus so much on your security and independence because the moth, vermin, and, and thieves, it's all this illustration. It may look secure, but something can get in in this way that you don't see, and it can take everything from you in a moment. For those of you that had a lot of money in the stock market in 2009, you might know what I'm talking about, right? And the thing is that there is the, the moth and vermin. This was an agrarian society, and so they understood this. They felt this even more because their wealth was actually in what they wore. And the moth would come in and take bites out of it and put holes in it. All of a sudden, that thing that looked so valuable was no longer that valuable. Or they would store up in storehouses all of their grain and, and store up for later. But then vermin would get in rodents at the cover of night and eat all this good stuff that they had stored up for themselves, and all of a sudden, what they thought was their treasure was now gone. So the eater was always a threat. That's kind of the, again, the Greek word is the eater. And one of the things I tell my kids all the time is watch out, or you're going to eat all your money. Because do you know that in America, we eat about 20% of our income? Like, that's literally, we're always eating it. Uh, not literal money, but you're eating all the food, and that is eating all that you're making. And so for us, we may not feel it in the same way of watch out for the moth and the vermin, where they break in and steal. Instead, we might feel it this way. It's like, watch out for your bank accounts, where kids and cars destroy. <laughs> watch out for your lawn, where moles and drought destroy. Watch out for your fitness, where binge-watching shows and donuts destroy. You know, like, it, it, there are these things that we might feel a little bit more that is trying to come in and take out the things that we treasure. So what are these treasures on earth? Well, it's often money, possessions, experiences, clothes, food, a house, a boat, a second house, a car, a second car, the fun car, or maybe the second boat. I don't really know what your thing is, but the, the way that it goes is it's always moving. This thing that we treasure, and then we treasure the next thing, and it's always going after something else that is actually only momentary and temporary. And Jesus is trying to rescue us from treasuring the things that don't last. Why do we tend to treasure things? Well, because we gain a sense of identity and security in these things. And they help us feel like we matter and maybe matter a little more than the other people around us. Because most of us, most of it's actually derived in comparison to others. It's not just about having that thing, it's about having a little better than the people around us. And it's not wrong to have things. Just be really careful that they don't have you. It's something we have to be guarding against in our lives. And so Jesus teaches on. He says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, Jesus is actually trying to rescue you from wasting your life on things that don't actually last. And he's saying, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's join in a little bigger perspective because I don't want you to waste your life. And so I have a little illustration we're going to look at to try to understand this a little more. We're going to come all the way over here. So this rope represents the timeline of eternity. And if we could stretch this all the way and could send it really forever that way, and recognize that it also went forever before us, we could begin to understand the timeline of eternity. God existed before we ever stepped onto the scene, and we are being prepared for eternity that's to come. And this section could represent all of human existence on earth. And during all of human existence, somewhere, maybe this represents your life. 
And we spend so much of our energy and focus and time all about this small section of the great timeline of eternity. And Jesus is saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures here. So many of us think that, well, if I save up, then maybe I can really make a huge impact in later. I'm going to store up, and I'm going to hit that number. That's what retirement's all about, right? It's all about having that number, and then I'm secure, and I'm going to be safe, and it's going to be the best. And so we spend so much time storing up treasures on earth when he's saying, don't do this. Store up treasures there. I don't want you to find security here. I want you to find security for all eternity to come. I have so much more for you than just living for this tiny little section of of human experience. And I want you to store up stuff that can never be taken, that can never be shaken, because you were made for more than this. You were made for eternity to come. So store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where nothing can take it. You see, Jim Elliott was a great missionary to, to the unreached people groups, and he said, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep, to gain that what he, which he cannot lose. And so we, we have to shift our perspective from the earthly to the heavenly I'm wearing my brother's win like heaven shoes today. And in, our, in that final year that I had with him, I researched heaven like crazy, trying to understand what is he about to step into? What is the experience that, that God has laid up for him? And oh my goodness, this rally cry of win like heaven really made sense the more I journeyed in. If we only knew the incredible place that God has prepared in advance for us, we would not spend so much time focused on the shadow lands of this life. We would be looking forward to the fullness of experience and adventure and life and color and beauty and joy that God has in store for us. Because we were made for more than anything this world offers No eye has seen, no mind has conceived what God has in in store in advance for those who love him. And God has eternity set for us, and he wants us to store up treasures in heaven. So what are these treasures in heaven or eternal rewards? Well, first off, it's not a bigger heavenly bank account, and it's not earned by giving more than others. Instead, um, R.T. France, uh, one of the best New Testament scholars on the book of Matthew, he said it this way. He said, those treasures are stored up not by performing meritorious acts, or what that means, and not by doing a bunch of good deeds, but by belonging to and living by the priorities of the kingdom of heaven. You see, we can do the right things with the wrong heart, but motives really matter, and as we treasure God, and as we treasure his kingdom, then what we're measured by is by our faithfulness, our stewardship, and our love with the gifts, resources, and opportunities that he's given to us. You see, there is this really intense moment that we're all going to face. At the end of our short experience of life, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, And we will give an account for the way that we lived our earthly experience. And 1 Corinthians 3 speaks to this idea that that whatever we do in life will be tested with fire. And it will, much of our life will burn up in self-seeking, pleasure, comfort seeking. And it will just be faded away. But there will be the acts done in faith, in generosity, in stewardship, in love that it says will remain, and those will be like gold, costly stones, and we will get to carry those with us into eternity to come. What are those rewards? What does that look like? I don't know exactly. Actually, Scripture is not super clear. It could be that those are real things that become part of our clothing, and we reflect God even more for eternity to come. 
It could be some type of role of leadership. We see some stuff spoken of in Scripture about that as well. Others point to uh, somehow that we would uh, be able to reflect God more or lay crowns at his feet or the mansion that he has prepared for us. But it's not about comparison about what are these eternal rewards. But instead, we must believe that God exists and that he is good and that he will reward in the right way. I actually think scripture is vague on purpose because we would start valuing the rewards more than the giver of the rewards. You see, the treasure is God himself. And we get more of him as we experience saying, you are good. I want more of you, God. I want to experience all that you have. You see, we can live out of two mindsets. One mindset is this life is all there is. And if you want to live in this life is all there is mindset, you better go get whatever you can. You better make all the money you can and store up for yourself everything you can in life. Find the best security you can. Try to get your name on a building so that your legacy can last you know, a few years longer than your earthly experience. Or you can believe the true story that the best is yet to come. And this is where God's people say, you know what, it's worth giving up to gain so much more. This is where I'm going to invest my life in what outlasts my life for eternity to come. And I'm going to be about the principles of the kingdom of heaven. In this mindset, Jesus is again trying to rescue us from wasting our lives. And he says, what's super important is for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As we treasure heaven, our heart begins to go there. And I know for me, over the last year, I began to treasure heaven more than ever. As my brother and my best friend are both there now, in the presence of the Father, my heart begins to treasure even more the goodness of the glory of God because I know that they're experiencing the fullness of life and the experience that God has prepared for us. And we have to recognize what we treasure because every person is looking for treasure. And your treasure determines your life. Whatever you're going after, whatever you treasure in your heart, you will begin to put all your time, energy, money, focus on that thing until you have it. And then you'll grasp it for a second. And it'll be like nothing. Or it will be the real thing that can never be taken or shaken Jesus tried to teach us this with an old Hebrew riddle next in his uh, teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And for us, we may not feel that right away, but what he's speaking to is the eye is such an interesting part of the body. And the Hebrew people would kind of debate, does light get into the body through the eyes, or is it emanating the light that is in someone through the eyes? And, and, and really quickly, as we think about our eyes, we have to recognize our attention does direct our life. So one aspect of the riddle is pay attention to your attention. Whatever gains it will dictate the way that you go. But even more, this is in the context of treasure. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying if, so healthy eyes are generous eyes. They are one looking to give, looking to pass life on to others. Unhealthy eyes are stingy eyes. They're trying to get more for themselves. They're the ones that never feel like they have enough. They live out of a scarcity mindset. And then he says, if the light within you is darkness, like if your generosity is stingy, how great is that darkness? It's kind of like you invite people over, and you're like, yeah, eat, drink, whatever you want. We're so glad that you're here. But you're like counting up how many times they went to the fridge. And you're like, why did you go back again? Really? Let's put a lock on that thing, right? And so somewhere there's this like stingy generosity because we either live out of the abundant mindset or the scarcity mindset. And you know, for me, I can naturally tend back to scarcity, like, oh no, what if? 
or I don't have enough because I think I need to store up enough to always have security and independence versus abundance. God, you already have enough. There was actually a season in my life where we were between roles in ministry. It was actually before I came here to Vineyard. I had left my previous job and I was wrestling with God with what he was calling us to next and we went months without paychecks and I began to really wrestle going, God, I don't know what you're doing. I turned down a job I was offered and I just basically turned it down to go, we're just going to drain every bit of what we just sold our house for and I don't know what you're going to do. Okay, God. Well, then all of a sudden some friends reached out and, and they said, hey, uh, we were praying, and we just heard God say, we're supposed to support you in this season. And we were like, what? Okay. Well, and they were like, and this is weird, but God gave us a number that was super clear, and so we're just going to send you a check. And, and we got the check a, about a week later because we were living in another town. And, and once we got the check, the check was for $5,001. $5,000 was the exact budget we had for all of our monthly expenses for us in that season. But the $1 spoke such a message to my heart. And he goes, and I have more than enough for you. Trust me. And so God so specifically was saying, live out of the abundance mindset. Stop living as if you've got to amass it all for yourself. Instead, know that I see you, I love you, and I will take care of you. And back to the riddle, the eyes are the window to the soul. So often we can look in someone's eyes and see the life that's inside of them. And that life is meant to be shared and given, not just stingily grabbed and held on to. And so he closes with this challenge. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It doesn't work. He, he's challenging this two-master thing because we go towards one or the other. For students in here, you might feel it. Like you are either going to kind of serve the teacher and academics and do your best, or you're going to serve all your students and friends that kind of buck the system and do whatever you want. Or those of you that have a boss, you can kind of serve the boss and the organization. Or you can instead kind of go with your coworkers and say, you guys are, let's get away with what we can, right? Or we can, again, have this fitness or food, work and family, entertainment and purpose, God and money. Like we're always going to feel tugged between two masters. But here's a truth you have to understand about money. You can serve God and have money, but you cannot serve money and have God because he won't be second because he is the one who has given every good gift and he's saying, use it for my glory. Stop storing up thinking you've got to get everything you can for your source of life, security, and joy. And I think it's so important in this season, again, we're like a week and a half before the election, your treasure should not be a candidate, okay? This is not where life is found. Instead, our treasure must be the king who is seated on the throne on November 5th. Because he is still going to be there. And he's still going to be in charge. And he's going to be the treasure for eternity to come. So may he gain our full focus, our full hearts, and may he call us into life that is truly life. As we walk out these treasure steps that I'm going to challenge you to today, one, one of the easiest ways to make sure that you're not serving money and that God is your core foundation of life is tithe. Simply say, I will not let money be my master. I'm going to set aside my first 10% to say, God, it's all yours, and I trust you to provide. And then two, I encourage you to fast. This Friday, join us in this fast where we say, Jesus, you are worth giving up because we're going to gain so much more. And it's this simple practice of looking forward and depending on and growing your connection with God. And as you fast and pray, here's my challenge. I want you to pray for three people who don't know Jesus. Don't just pray that you're going to get more and that this is going to be a better season for you. Instead, pray for eternity to be shifted, that others might know Jesus that they might experience his kingdom, because that's what we're about to celebrate, y'all. 
we're about to go nuts because people are about to get dunked in the tank because they gave their life to Jesus and eternity was shifted. And like, that's actually worth celebrating. Like, this is, you know, so often we're like, this is the most consequential election of a lifetime. Or this is this, this football game today. They have to win. It means so much. Well, wait a second. Uh, it's pretty short. But what we're about to celebrate affects all that. And so as, as you reflect, as you experience baptisms, I pray two things happen in this room. One, you reflect back on your journey. You reflect back on the fact that uh, David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Maybe you go back and you remember your first love. Maybe you go back and you remember the freedom that he purchased for you. And, and you just go, wow, every time somebody goes under and comes back up, you're like, yeah, I get to live a new life. I celebrate the new life in that person and I wanna embrace the new life Jesus has purchased for me even more. Maybe you repent and come back to your first love. Or maybe for you, you've not experienced Jesus. And today we wanna to invite you, Clay's gonna talk in just a minute more about how you could just say, you know what? I need Jesus in my life. I'm tired of living for this short little experience. I wanna be prepared with security for eternity to come. Well, in Christ, in Christ alone, you can find life that is truly life for now and forevermore. He died to, to forgive you of your sins and give you life for eternity to come. And if you want to receive that today, we'd love to celebrate with you. We could baptize you today and you can join us. And we are ready to celebrate the victory of winning like heaven today and for eternity to come. So I'm going to pray for us as we reflect and as we prepare. And we're going to join in and start celebrating baptisms. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross in my place for my sins. Man, I didn't deserve it. But I'm so thankful that you gave grace to a broken sinner like me. And I thank you so much for each person who's going into the waters today. I pray that you would seal this moment in their minds. That every time the enemy tries to lie to them in the future, they would say, no, I am washed, I am clean, I am wrapped in the love of God. And I pray that for anybody in here today that is wrestling with a relationship with you or not, God, would you push them across the line? I pray that somebody would say yes to you today. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to move in this place. And for some, that you would just call them back through their journey in this moment and help them to treasure you, the treasure of heaven, Jesus. And for others, that this would be a moment of just repentance, of returning and loving the goodness that you've placed in our hands for such a time as this, God. We are grateful. We celebrate new life. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Give it up for D. McKee. Yes, so good. Way to put it in perspective, bro. Um, all right, well, baptism candidates, why don't y'all go ahead and get lined up? Look at them, look at them. Come on, give it up for the baptism candidates, y'all. We going in, baptism day, dunk day. Um, they're about to publicly declare something that went down in their heart a while ago. They said yes to Jesus. And baptisms is a public declaration of inner transformation. Baptism in and of itself doesn't make you get saved. Only the precious blood of Jesus can do that, okay? But... Baptism is what we do when we say yes to him. Why? Because we were commanded. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, you know, go and baptize uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Son, and Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus, that's what we do. So they are stepping into that great commandment, okay? So um, if you are um, here right now and you're thinking to yourself, like, you know what? I've said yes to Jesus and I have not yet made that public declaration. I want you to come see us. I want you to come talk to us. Um, and we can make something happen. We can talk to you through that. Otherwise, let's go ahead and have the testimonies. Come on up. Come on up, guys. We have some people that are about to give testimonies, public, live testimonies on what Jesus 
done, thank you, what Jesus did for them, you know, why they want to get baptized. So first up, we have Margaret. Come on up, Margaret. Y'all give it up for Margaret. Make her feel welcome. Yes. So, Margaret, why, ma'am, do you want to get baptized today? So I've always considered myself a Christian, but I didn't think about him a lot. I didn't know him. And it wasn't until about six years ago, um, my boyfriend at the time, now husband's parents, invited me to come to Vineyard Cincinnati. And for the first time, I heard him, and I listened, and I've been walking towards him ever since, and, and now I am ready to run. Now, you, now you're ready to go in, huh? Yes, I am. Right, y'all. Give it up for Margaret. Thank you so much. Go on. Julius, can y'all give, give some love to Julius, y'all? It's going in, going in. So... Sir, why, why do you want to get baptized, my friend? Baptism is the next step in my progression to absolutely serving Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Let's go. Let's go. That's the next step. That's the next step. And, and he, he's apparently taking you from the deep dark, and now you are walking in this light, right? Absolutely. Uh, I gave my life to Christ in January of 2014, and I've been listening to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, ever since. And, and really, since I gave my life to Christ, people think that it's difficult to be a Christian, but it's actually relieving because you've got one direction, and that's to follow Christ. Let's go. Give it up for Julius, my man. Let's go. You ready for this? I'm ready. All right, let's go, buddy. Gabe, come on, give it up for, give us some love. Come on, man, come on, man, step on up, step on up. You ready for this, bro? I am. So why do you want to get dunked today? Because the Lord helped me one day, a few years ago, when I was in middle school. I was troubled with uh, depression and anxiety, and it really took over my life. And it cursed me with thoughts of suicide and wanting to kill myself. And I was so scared, I was fighting alone, I, I didn't know what to do. I was broken on the ground. Man. The Lord came to me one day. He helped me. He picked me up and took my hand and said, I'm going to walk with you and help you find a path in the light. And he, he walks with me every day. He, to, he told me my reason. He made me a better person. And now every day I make sure to make everyone else's lives better. So I try to be his warrior to show his love and his light. Yo, so good, Gabe. So good, Gabe. Let's go. That's worthy of following the king right there, sir. Good stuff. Good stuff. Come on, give it up for Joe, our final candidate, giving his testimony. Joe, um, who is Jesus to you, and why do you want to get baptized uh, in him? Jesus is my Savior. I was lost and broken. Seven years ago, he stepped into my life, asked me four things, gave me four answers, changed the course of my life. And he asked me, will I run forward with him? Not walk, run. And I have since. He has changed my entire life. He's changed the course. He opened my heart. And the biggest thing he showed me was the love that we have for each other is infinitely smaller than what the love he gives us each and every day. And the reason I'm doing this today is he's calling me to do more. And this is the step that he's asked me to do to show me that I am 100% with him and for him and will spread his word every day. Let's go. Yeah. Hey, let's go. Joe, my man. All right. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited. Again, y'all, listen, uh, Revelation 12, 11. And we defeated the enemy by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, and to love not our life even unto death. Some of you here, you probably heard the testimony. You probably heard their stories, and you, you probably were gripped. There's something probably that's moving tangibly in you. You probably feel a stirring. If you, again, if you feel like that's you today, not only wanting to get baptized, you want to say yes to the king. Come down here, talk to Daniel. Come down here, talk to somebody here up front. We would love to meet up with you and talk with you through that decision. Otherwise, are y'all ready? Are y'all ready to celebrate? Y'all ready to get down with the get down? Listen, if you have family members coming up here getting ready to, to you know, do the do, you can come on up.
you can celebrate with. You can, you can be a part of that. You can, and then we ask that you then move out the way for the next family to come through, okay? Don't, don't hog the view, you know what I mean? So, but if you've never been here, we like to stand up. We like to get crunk because people are about to get dunked out here, okay? So let's all stand up. We're going to celebrate in here. We're going in. D already said we celebrate in eternity, baby. Eternity, baby. Let's go. Turn it up.
those walls that we could see and shake They're like prison that we couldn't escape But he came, and he died, and he rose oh, Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we could death in the grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose With those giants out there now
I don't know about you guys, but as I watched each person go in, I went, man, that's another story for the glory of God. Wow, what happened in this space just now? That's incredible, y'all. And we get to keep celebrating with our lives as we keep extending the kingdom of God. As we live by the principles of the kingdom, we are storing up treasure in heaven. So don't store up treasures for yourself on earth. Store up treasures in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And where your heart goes, your life goes. And I encourage you this week to treasure him above all else. Ministry teams are going to be available up here. If you want to come on forward, ministry teams, I encourage you, receive prayer over whatever might be contending for your attention, what might be contending to be your treasure. Experience some freedom today. Maybe you're going to come to know Jesus today and let this prayer team just pray over you so that they can, you can begin to experience God and his purpose, his plan, his presence in your life. For many of you, we also invite you to invest in what outlasts. We would invite you to serve with Vineyard students, Vineyard kids. And, and today, as we close, if you want to receive prayer or if you want to receive communion, you are invited to do that before you go. But may you walk in the freedom that Jesus has purchased for you. And may you walk in the purpose that he has specifically for your life. And may you treasure the eternal treasure that cannot be shaken or taken. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings. Have an incredible week.